Well, here's a question for you. <clears throat> what do you do when your world just comes crashing down upon you? Uh, where do you turn? And you may say, well, well, what do you mean? Well, it happens to people in various ways. Maybe you're in your 30s, everything's going well, you go to the doctor for some little thing that has come up, and the doctor announces that it's terminal. Your world crashes down. You've got a good job, good career path, been there for years, you see no reason for it to end, you come into work one day and they tell you you're done, don't need you anymore. Maybe you're 50s, 60s, who's going to hire you? And you go from being a well-paid individual to some minimum wage job somewhere. Your whole world comes crashing down. You're happily married. You come home one day and your spouse announces that from their perspective it's all been a farce and they're ending the marriage. And your world comes crashing down. You lose a child. Probably the worst of all these scenarios. And your world comes crashing down. What do you do when that happens? Where do you turn? What happens to your faith? Or perhaps let's go to the other end of the equation. There's nothing really bad happening in your life. But on the other hand, there's nothing really good either. You're in that place we talked about a few messages back. You're just living a life of quiet desperation, putting one foot in front of the other, doing the right thing, hoping to get through, but there's really no joy. There, there's really no payoff, it seems, for you. What do you do? How do you live a life believing in God's providence when you can find absolutely no evidence in your life that he even exists, let alone that he loves and cares about you? What do you do? Well, this is where our dear friend Mordecai finds himself this morning. His whole world is coming crashing down. Now, to set the stage, Mike read for us from beginning in chapter 4, verse 1. I want to back up just a little bit into chapter 3. I'm going to pick it up here with verse uh, <clears throat> 13. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of this document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Now, if you've been following along in this series, you know that in, in Persia at that time, when the king issued a decree, it was irrevocable and unchangeable even by the king himself. Little hope that anything is going to change. What's more, we find how little the king cares about any of this. Uh, he and Haman are having a little party. They're having a few drinks together, yucking it up a little bit. Probably talking about, ah, those, those Jews are going get, to get it now. We'll take care of them. We'll show them. And we see that the whole city is thrown into confusion. And probably the whole empire is thrown into confusion. Because it, you, you have to imagine that there are citizens in Persia uh, that don't hate the Jews as Haman does. And they're probably wondering, well, what is this all about? But again, there's nothing they can do. Mordecai's world has come crashing down. 
verse 1, chapter 4, when Mordecai learned that all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Now some of you have probably been right where Mordecai is at some point in your life. Now we're Westerners, you know, we, we have a little more decorum than to sit down and tear our clothes and sit in ashes and wear sackcloth. But some of you have felt that way inside at some times in your life. And you cry out to God and you cry out sometimes bitterly because that's all you have left to do. Now, traditionally, uh, putting on, tearing your clothes, putting on sackcloth and ashes uh, was representative of, of sadness, of repentance, and of uh, taking a humble posture uh, before God, of, of saying, Lord, I've reached my end, there's nothing I can do, there's nowhere I can go, there's no way to solve this problem. And why won't you intervene? Well, we don't know everything that was going through Mordecai's mind. But I think we're, we're safe in assuming a few things about him. And, and you always want to be careful uh, when you are uh, assigning motives to biblical characters when the motive isn't spelled out. Uh, but I don't think we're going to go too far awry here. I do not, do not think it's too far of a stretch to say that Mordecai is overwhelmingly sad over the pending fate of his people. Because after all, what brought this decree about? Was it not Mordecai's refusal to bow down to Haman? So now... Because of him, in one sense, his entire race is scheduled to be eliminated. Repentant. I think he is repentant over his equivocation. Remember we saw how he had lived up until now, a life sort of, of accommodation, just fit in, lay low, uh, don't, don't say anything about uh, your Jewishness, about being one of God's people, just uh, do your work, go home, and get by. He recognizes, I believe, his total helplessness. But there's more going on here. We see that he lets out this loud and bitter cry. To whom would you suppose this bitterness is directed? And this is kind of hard, but it's a fact. We're God's people. But sometimes, even though we may be reticent to admit it, because in some circles it just wouldn't be the thing to do, we are bitter with God. Because our life has become such a hell or so mundane and we see no hope we see no change we see no evidence that God is doing anything that we cry out to him in bitterness isn't it great that we serve such a kind and loving God that he allows us to do that he doesn't stamp us out he doesn't slap us down he allows us to vent he allows us to come to him with our true emotions yeah, you know, it's always struck me as kind of funny that sometimes, you know, we'll pray to God and, and we'll say, and, you know, thank you for Joe. And be with Joe and, and help Joe. And we're doing the thing, we're praying for our enemy, and inside we're thinking, I'd like to kill that sucker. <laughs> yeah. Now, don't you suppose God knows what's going on inside? So why don't you just tell God the truth? Yeah. God allows it. His love for us is so great that he allows us to question him. He allows us to rant and rave and go on and on. Anger, disappointment, 
the feeling <clears throat> that I, Mordecai, am being terribly unfairly treated. Because that's what it always comes down to. You realize that. <clears throat> Anger, resentment, bitterness. It's always, I'm being unfairly treated. Okay. If we could get over ourselves, now, which we don't seem to be able to do, and by the way, I can't do it either, we wouldn't be angry anymore. We wouldn't be resentful anymore. We wouldn't be bitter anymore. We wouldn't feel like we were unfairly treated. But we just can't seem to do it. Though we, we work on it. Or I hope we do anyway. Mordecai's bitter cry to God, I believe, though it's not written down here, is, Lord, it's just not fair. You ever feel like that? You know, God, it's just not fair. Mordecai says, I live my whole life waffling, wavering. I know I'm your, one of your people, but I'm not going to tell anybody. And now finally, I get a little backbone. I stand up. I say, I'm not going to bow down to Haman. And you not only ruin my life, but all the lives of all these other people. How can that be fair? I think we can all identify with Mordecai here. This is one of the great things about biblical characters and biblical heroes. They all, all have feet of clay, just like us. There's not a one of them that lived a perfect life and then one day God says, I'm going to use so-and-so because they've lived the perfect life and never let me down. But every single one of them had let God down someplace. And some of them, big time, you know. And the reason I like that is not because I like to see people fail, but because I fail so often, it gives me hope. God doesn't just use the perfect. He doesn't just use the well-manicured, uh, tall, good-looking, intelligent people. He uses short, ugly people like me. <laughs> you know, so there's hope for all of us. Sometimes we tend to read these stories and we romanticize these, these heroes and heroines. And we think, well, they were always so perfect. They were always so in tune with what God was doing in their lives. When nothing could be further from the truth. But God is going to use Mordecai. It just dawned on me. Mordecai is pretty close to sounding like mediocrity. And that's where Mordecai was up until he refused to bow down to Haman. And that's where a lot of us have been. But that's all right. God can and will still use us. So Mordecai comes up with a plan. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit here to give you an idea of what his plan is going to be. We'll go up here to verse 9. We'll start back here in verse 8. Mordecai gives this eunuch a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king, beg his favor, and plead with him on her behalf. Now this is Mordecai's plan. And of course, he wants, what he wants her to do is go to the king and ask the king to somehow figure out a way to spare the Jews. Okay, well, let's leave Mordecai sitting there in his ash heap with his sackcloth and his clothes all torn, wondering why God has abandoned him. And let's visit a little bit with Esther. Pick it up. You know, here in verse 2. Well, no. No, no, no. Verse 4. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. Now, that what they did, they came and told her that Mordecai was sitting out there in the gate with his, uh, in his ash heap and doing his thing there. What, is, what does Esther do? Well, she sends garments 
to clothe Mordecai, so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's units, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why this was. And then we have verses 8 and 9 that we, we just read a, a moment ago. Now before we go on, honestly, what do you guys think of Esther so far? You don't, don't say out loud. But what, what if Esther wanted to join Parkside Church? Would you welcome her with open arms? Would you say, now here's a woman of character. I don't think so. I would hope because of the, the character of Parkside Church, we would op welcome her with open arms. But there are a lot of places she would not be welcomed with open arms. Because again, as our hero, our heroine has feet of clay. I mean, what, what has she done so far? She obtained her position as queen based solely on her good looks, her ability to charm people, and forgive me, her performance in the bedroom. Or wouldn't we want to wag our fingers at that? I would, would hope not. She has uh, <clears throat> totally concealed the fact that she is one of God's people. She has gone out of her way to make sure nobody knows she's a Jew. And nobody does. She is engaged in an ethically dubious marriage to a pagan, which was forbidden for the Jews to do. But she did it anyway. Now, I realize that she was ordered to do that by the king, uh, and if you say no, you're probably going to lose your head. But wouldn't she be a better heroine if she had stood up and said, no, I'm a good Christian girl, I can't do that, Pop, she loses her head, and then we could say, well, look at Esther. And that would be great. I mean, uh, I, I like church history, and you get into the, the first century church, and you see a lot of that, people being martyred for their faith. And, and those folks are, I admire them greatly. But I think most of us everyday folks, barring the uh, invasion of the Holy Spirit in our lives at that moment, which sometimes he does, we might be a little more like Esther. We'd want to keep our head. We'd want to go along to get along. Now, I'm not recommending that course. I'm recommending the other. But I don't know which I would do at that moment, and neither do you. So Esther, so far, has not been a paragon of virtue, nor a spiritual giant. And now, because of her, we, we want to make sure we note this, because of her lifestyle, she is totally isolated from her people. Remember, she's sequestered in the harem within the palace. And so she doesn't know what's going on at all. It, and someone tells her about her uncle Mordecai and what he's doing out there. Well, now Esther's a good person, so she wants to help Mordecai. I mean, this guy took her in. Remember, he adopted her. He's raised her. Uh, he treated her well. So now she wants to, to take care of whatever his problem is. So what does she do? Well, since she isn't exactly a paragon of spirituality, she sends him new clothes. Obviously, that's what he needs. He needs new clothes. Let's, let's just fix up the outside. We won't worry about the, the, the real problem. You see. I was listening to Alistair Begg. He was preaching on this, this passage here. And uh, his, his remark about this was, you can't fix the inside by dressing up the outside. And isn't that true? 
I mean, she sends him all these nice clothes, and he could have put them on, but it wouldn't have made any difference to his situation as his death was imminent, and he would have simply died in nice clothes instead of sackcloth. You're just as dead. But Esther thought she was doing the right thing, but because she had isolated herself from the people of God, she didn't really know what the right thing was. And, you know, we do that too. If, we're, if we isolate ourselves, if we're withdrawn, if, if we're not engaged with, with other Christians, we oftentimes respond superficially rather than spiritually to problems. You cannot clean up the inside by dressing up the outside. Oh, well, pastor, I never do that. Really. I've heard stories, I don't know that I believe them, but I've heard stories that sometimes you ladies will just, you, you, you go buy a new purse because you don't feel good. Or you, or you go buy a new outfit so you'll feel better. You know, and, and we guys aren't any better. In fact, we're probably a little worse because we spend big money. We go buy a new car. We buy a boat, you know. And that's going to make me feel better about myself. It's going to make my inside feel better if I cover my outside in a new Corvette. Oh, it would work. I'm sure it would work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or maybe if I just had a, a different spouse. That's, that's the key. How many people have tried that only to find it didn't work so well? Or maybe if I, if I just lived over there, wherever over there is. You see, but all those changes, all that outside superficiality doesn't touch the problem. We need to trick Touch the problem. But now here's the good news. In all of this mess that Esther and Mordecai find themselves in, the Holy Spirit is working. That invisible hand that we've talked about of the, God's providence is working, and he's working in their lives. Now they don't know it. But the reason we know he's working is because Esther now wants to know more. Wants to know more. Look at, at uh, verse 5. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai and learn what was this and why it was. In other words, why didn't she accept the clothes? How come that didn't make you feel better? What's going on? I want to know more. And see, that oftentimes when you're, you're dealing with people, they won't say, I want to know about God. I want to know about Jesus. They'll just say, well, tell me a little more about this or that or some area of your life or something you've experienced. And, and that's the Holy Spirit. And he's working unseen. And Esther wants to know more. Well, as we see, we'll see now she's finally beginning to, to come around a little bit. She's beginning to think a little deeper. She's beginning to uh, let the Holy Spirit touch her heart, begin to work. And she's beginning to think about some, some spiritual things. Surely, now all will be well. Not really. Verses 6 through 8. Mordecai tells her about his plan. Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for her destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg for his favor, plead with him on behalf of of her people. No. Esther has just been outed. Mordecai tells Hathach to tell Esther to plead on behalf of her people. She has been outed. She is now branded as one of God's people. And where is she living? In the king's harem. 
probably not a great place for one of God's people to be. I'm sure she is concerned. The cat is out of the bag. What's going to happen now? Well, it gets even more frightening. And Hathis went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathis and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king for these past 30 days. Now she's, she's in a bind because her uncle, whom she loves, whom she trusts, has told her to go into the king, but the law says if anyone comes to the king of their own volition without being called by the king, they lose their head unless he decides to show mercy and hold out his scepter to them. Now these kings, these Persian kings, were if there was one thing they were not known for, it was mercy. They were known for fits of anger and, and killing people and all those sorts of things. And then she says, she adds an interesting thing. She says, I have not gone into the king for 30 days. Well, what's that talking about? Well, it means that she's not number one anymore in the king's eyes. You see, she has slipped in his estimation. And you know, this is what happens always in superficial relationships. Her relationship with the king is certainly superficial. It's built on her beauty and her abilities in the bedroom. Yeah. If that's all we build our relationships on with people, they're not going to last. It's, it's just in, inevitable. And that's what's happened here. Esther is no longer the favorite. We have a new favorite. And that's always what happens in these situations. There's always a new favorite out there. So she says, to, she says, man, you're asking me to risk my life. What's going on in Esther's mind now? She's now identified as one of God's people. She's out of favor with the king. Well, let's not say out of favor, but she's not in that place of great favor any longer. You think she might be a little resentful? She might wonder, well, what's God doing to me? How come he's beating me up now? But God is working. Esther has moved from a place of isolation to a place of identification. You see? She was isolated from God and God's people. Now, though it wasn't necessarily of her own volition, Mordecai kind of helped her along, but now she has moved to a place of identification, of identifying with God and identifying with God's people. Surely, all will be well. But you've been at this long enough to know that that's not the case. Mordecai now increases the pressure. In verses 12 through 14, he says, you go into the king and you beg for your people. And that's, that, I tell you, it's that way in our lives sometimes. We're over here and we're kind of muddling along and everything's okay and we know we're going to go to heaven when we die. And then that's fine, that's cool. Maybe we show up church once in a while. And then something happens, the Holy Spirit works on us, and we move over here. And now we're going to church all the time, and you know, maybe we were given a little money here and there, and, we're, and we think, now God has to be pleased with me, everything's going to go well. <laughs> and it doesn't. God increases the pressure. Because He doesn't want us to stop here, He wants us to go on over here. And that's what He wants to happen in Esther's life. We move a little toward God and he increases the pressure. What will Esther do? The safe thing to do is to do nothing. Okay? 
And how often do we choose that path when God is trying to move us somewhere? You know, I don't, it, and it, it, with us, by his blessing, he's not usually tr asking us to risk our very physical lives. But he may just be asking us to spend a little time in a small group or spend a little more time reading his word or, or whatever it is he's calling us to do. But we don't want to commit the time. We don't want to commit our lives. So God increases the pressure. You know, how much could we spare ourselves if we would just listen attentively the first time and move to where God is trying to move us? I would think probably a lot. So what will Esther do? What will we do? Will we remain in the perceived safety of the harem or take a risk? Esther chooses to risk, but she is no longer alone. Look at verses uh, 15 and 16. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, <clears throat> night or day, I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Wow. We're seeing a little different woman now, aren't we? Now, all of a sudden, she's filled with the Spirit. She's motivated. She says to Mordecai, Okay, I'm going to do this thing, but I need help. I need the, the community of saints, if you will. I need other people praying for me, supporting me, other people of God praying for me, supporting me, the people I now identify with. So you get all the folks out there praying, and I'll get my little entourage in here praying. We'll all pray, and then after that, I will go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. Now that's an interesting phrase. And it has a little different connotation in the Hebrew grammar than you get in English. In English, it kind of comes out like, okay, well, if she perish, perishes, that's one possible outcome of many outcomes. But in the Hebrew, uh, it is uh, much more certain. In other words, she is saying, I'm probably going to perish. Because look at the evidence, I'm no longer number one, I'm just a, one of a bunch of women here, and if I go in there, busting in there, and you remember back in chapter one, they wanted to make sure the women kept their place, remember? So in the, in the Hebrew it comes out, if I perish, and I probably will, so be it. Now this took some internal fortitude. This took some, some real faith that God is going to take care of her. And then the final verse, Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Well, what do we learn from all this? A couple of three things, I would think. One is this. In the midst of chaos and catastrophe, Mordecai becomes a man of great faith. It's interesting that in the midst of his comfortable job, his comfortable life, his comfortable everything, he was a very weak man of little faith. But in the midst of chaos and catastrophe, he becomes a man of great faith. And how do I know that? Well, I know that by uh, verse 14, the first part of it. And here's what it says. That's Mordecai talking. For if you keep silent, he's talking to Esther, at this time relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. In other words, he's saying to Esther, whether you're involved or not, God's plan is going to take place and God is going to preserve his people. There's no way he could have known that except on faith. There was no evidence. The decree is still out there. They're all going to die. But Mordecai has now become a man of great faith. In fact, I would rank Mordecai right up there with Abraham. And you remember the story of Abraham and Isaac when he was told to go sacrifice Isaac? 
And you've, you've heard all kinds of sermons on that. I, here's the main point in that. It's in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. And he's, he's taken the boy and his entourage, and they've gone along, and they've come to the, the place where they're going to go up on this mountain and sacrifice. And here's what Abraham says. He says, you guys stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there or up on the mountain, depending on your translation, and we will worship, and what? Return to you. Now, Abraham had some kind of faith that something other than what everybody thought was going to happen was going to happen. But he had every intention of sacrificing Isaac. And yet, he tells his his young men, that when we get through, we're coming back. The same faith that Mordecai is now showing. Which helps us to make sense of passages of Scripture that sometimes really confuse us. And I'm thinking of James here. Uh, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 2. Let me read this for you. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet with various kinds of testing of your faith because that testing produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing so James says count it all joy when you're involved in trials now if that passage has never bugged you there's something wrong with you <laughs> what do you mean count it all joy when my world's collapsing when, it's, when things are falling apart around me well, what he means is because that's going to build your faith. That's going to shore you up spiritually so that you can endure whatever it is that comes before you. The second thing I think we can learn is that Esther has moved from a place of isolation from God and his people to embracing them both. There's no place in Scripture where we see a Lone Ranger Christian. Or a Lone Ranger Jew in the Old Testament. God created us for community. Community with him. Community with one another. Esther's faith has grown to the point where she is willing to literally give her life for God's people. Mordecai, I think we can say, has the face of an Abraham. Esther now has the face of Daniel and his three cohorts who are going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Let me uh, read that for you. I think we talked about that verse once already in this series. But here it is. Now, there's the fiery furnace. Here are the, the Hebrew children. Here's Nebuchadnezzar. And here's what they have to say. If this be so, Nebuchadnezzar has just told them he's going to throw them in a furnace, burn them up. That'll be the end of them because they wouldn't bow down to words for his statue. They say, if this be so, if you throw us in there, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. Notice they do not say our God will deliver us from the fiery furnace because they don't know. But they know that he's able to do it if he chooses. And he will, though, deliver us from your hand, O king. So... He's either going to deliver him out of that furnace or deliver him through that furnace into heaven and they're out of the king's hand. But it is not, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image. That's where Esther is now in her faith. In this short little chapter, Esther has moved from that the cowering little woman that, you know, just hopefully I'll look good enough to get through this thing, to now a great woman of strong faith equal to a Daniel. That's pretty cool. Okay. We need this kind of faith because we will have trouble too, in case you hadn't noticed that in your life. You will have trouble. Jesus told us. In this world, you will have tribulation. Okay. So we might as well prepare for it. Uh, Job, I, I, like, I like the way uh, Job says it in Job 5.7. Uh, he says, uh, For man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. 
I'll bet you found that to be true in your lives. Trouble just seems to happen to us. We don't have to try. Third, and this is very important, especially for you people that are like me. Former failures and present fears do not disqualify you from God's service. Okay? Know that. If you don't get anything else out of this message, know that. Former failures and present fears do not disqualify you from God's service. If they did, we wouldn't have a single hero or heroine in the Bible. You see. Because God doesn't look at where you've been. He looks at where you are and where he wants you to go. And sometimes those former failures are the things that have made you into the person that you are now so that God can use you in the future. You see? So, and along that line, when we look at people and we see that they have trouble in their lives, and they look like they're not walking with the Lord. And you, you just want to shake your head and say, well, how can God use them? Look what they're doing. Don't. Don't. Because God may use them mightily. We don't know. There was no indication that Mordecai or Esther were God's people. If you could have observed them from the outside. And yet God was working mightily in their lives not just to move them, but to save an entire people. And so always remember that. And when we look at people that are struggling, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, whatever it is, look at them with eyes of compassion. And remember that, you know, maybe they're not doing what you think they ought to be doing. But maybe God's doing a work in them. And he's preparing them, and he's molding them, and he's taking some time. We don't know. But compassion over judgmentalism is always the right choice. And I know when I get to heaven, sometimes my more conservative friends, if you can get more conservative than I am, my liberal friends don't think you can, but sometimes my more conservative friends think that I am too gracious about people's sins. And here's my response. Maybe so. But when I get to heaven, I would much rather have God say to me, Daryl, you erred on the side of grace too often than have him say, Daryl, you erred on the side of judgmentalism too often. You see? And I think as Christians, in fact, I, um, I, I got a great article in my email I looked at just this morning um, and it, it talked about how the world sees us as just judgmental not as a compassionate people and that's what we want to be as a compassionate people because we don't know what God's doing in other people's lives who knows only God knows so I leave you with Hebrews 10 24 and 25 do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together because we need one another. And I think the reason we withdraw is we're afraid that we're going to receive judgment from our fellow Christians instead of compassion. If we knew we were going to receive compassion, we might not withdraw so often. So, there you go. We still don't know what's going to happen. They're still not in a good place. They're, they have great faith now, but Mordecai is still sitting on his ash heap. And Esther's still in the harem. So come back next week and we'll find out what happens. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a kind, compassionate God. Thank you that your word does tell us that when we need to, we can come boldly before your throne of grace and we will receive mercy and compassion according to the need of the moment. We, have to, we can have no fear of coming into your presence. It's not, uh, not like the Persian kings at all where we had to come with fear and trembling wondering if we would be received or rejected. 
Because again, your word tells us that all that come to you will be accepted. And so, Lord, help us to be more compassionate, a little less judgmental, a little more loving towards others. And Lord, help us to have the faith of an Abraham and a Mordecai or an Esther and a Daniel so that when in times of trouble we will not waver, we will not falter, we will firmly fix our eyes upon you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.